After the great fire in 1666 that leveled London, the world's most famous architect at the time, Christopher Wren, was commissioned to rebuild St. Paul's Cathedral. One day in 1671, Christopher Wren observed three bricklayers on a scaffold. One was crouched down, another was half standing, the other was standing tall, and that one standing tall was clearly the best worker. And so he asked a question to all three of them. He said, what are you doing? And the first said, I'm a bricklayer. I'm working hard to build bricks for my family so that I can feed them. The second said, I'm a bricklayer. I'm building a wall. And the third said, I'm a bricklayer. I'm building a great cathedral to the Almighty. Each one of them was doing the same work in the hot sun, building bricks, hard, manual labor. The first bricklayer had a job. The second had an occupation. The third had a calling. When we have a why to our lives, it makes all the difference. The quality of our life, the quality of our work is transformed. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used to say, if a man is called by God to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets the way Michelangelo painted and Beethoven composed and Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts on heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. Today we continue a four-week sermon series on our first core value, living contemplatively. And even though it's our first core value, I wanted to deal with it last. Because in some ways, nothing really can flow without this first one. Living contemplatively. The word contemplative literally means with temple. Living contemplatively is learning to see with temple eyes, with God's eyes, to recognize the sacred in other people, in ourselves, in the work, even the menial work that God would have us do in this life. And when we see the sacred all around us and within us, we can love inclusively. We realize everyone else is just part of this fabric, this beautiful fabric. We can share generously, do our part as generously and graciously as we can, and that's the heart of justice letting others live into the fullness of who they are. In November 21, we adopted these four core values and we wrote a statement for each of them. Here's the statement we wrote for living contemplatively. We seek to be fully present to life as it is, purposeful in our approach to living and grateful for our blessings. We are pilgrims on a journey being transformed by our experience and moving with faith toward Christ's vision of health and wholeness for all. I love that statement. That's a good statement. Last week we explored the value and the power of stillness and we played with T.S. Eliot's metaphor for God, that God is the still point in the turning world. And we talked about the importance of learning to cultivate stillness in our lives, learning how to pause, learning how to hit the reset button, learning how to take a deep breath or to let the soul, our soul, catch up with us. And when we can do this, we can see more clearly, we are restored, we're renewed in our spirit, and ultimately reconnect with a power greater than ourselves, our God-given power. Today, I want to look at the importance of living a purposeful life, a life that is aligned with our values, our deepest and deeply held values. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl does a deep dive or did a deep dive into the people who lived through the Holocaust, and he paid particular attention to those who survived when so many others couldn't. And what he discovered was that people who found a purpose, even in this tragic situation, were able to survive. And that purpose, the purpose that truly fueled them through the horror, was caring for others. That was the game changer. And he came up with this powerful line that he who has a why to live, can survive anyhow, 
anything that happens, we can survive if we have purpose in our lives. He wrote that life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by a lack of meaning and purpose. When we have no meaning and purpose in our lives, that's unbearable. That's unbearable. Simon Sinek, author of Start With Why, builds on this idea. He says, working hard for something we don't care about is stress. But working hard for something we love is passion. Passion. People with calling and purpose and meaning have passion. And that passion is infectious. In fact, the poet David White goes to so far as to say the antidote to burnout or stress is not simply rest, although that's important, as we discussed last week. Pausing, letting the soul catch up, all that's important. But the antidote to burnout, according to the poet, is living wholeheartedly, living with passion and purpose. The Apostle Paul, I think, is leading us in that direction here. He says, let every detail, everyone, words, actions, whatever be done in the name of Jesus. Thanking God every step of the way. Whatever task you do, work. Even if it's street sweeping, work as if your soul depends upon it as you are doing it for the Lord and not for your masters. For you serve Christ. There it is. In our hyper-individualistic culture, we are conditioned to put the self at the center. The self at the center of our lives. And so we ask, who am I? But we're just asking our small self. What am I supposed to do? What do I want to do? What work can I do? But as Douglas Steer points out, that ancient question, who am I, must necessarily lead to the better question, which is, whose am I? Whose am I? For there is no self without relationship. There's no self without our relationship to the one who created us, to our God, to the Almighty. Parker Palmer in his book, Let Your Life Speak, which we've been journeying with uh, in the mornings and the evenings on Tuesday, writes, don't tell your life what you intend to do with it. Don't tell your life what you intend to do with it. Listen to your life and see what it intends to do with you. You see, the self can't be the center It's too small. It can't bear the weight, the burden, the responsibility. God's the center. God's the center of your life and mine. And God can bear the weight and the responsibility and the burden of discovering what is yours to do. God has knit you together in your mother's womb. God has given you unique gifts. God knows you better than you know yourself, which means that the question of values and purpose is a God question. Otherwise, it's just too small. So I've been thinking about this a lot this week, as you might imagine, and this metaphor came to me, and I like it. I've been playing with it. When we're not aligned with our purpose, our purpose and values are not aligned, it's like we're burning dirty energy. And when we're aligned, it's like burning clean energy. So stay with me for a moment. Just as burning fossil fuels creates harmful pollutants into the environment, right, living a life that is misaligned creates a lot of pollution, emotional pollution, psychological pollution, stress, resentment, dissatisfaction, negativity, a lack of meaning and purpose, and that affects the climate of your marriage, of your family, of your community, of your workplace. It's a pollutant, and it leads to environmental degradation. But it's even deeper than that. Just as dirty energy is inefficient, wasteful, and unsustainable, think of how much energy we waste when we're not aligned. We're wasting so much energy, when we aren't true to our God-given selves, our God-created selves, when we're not true to the values that we hold most dear. And we become dependent on finite resources, material success, status, privilege, all the things that in the end aren't sustainable 
and can't sustain us and ultimately lead us to be depleted and lead to depletion everywhere. But when we align ourselves, our purpose with our values, we start to burn clean energy. Just as using clean energy produces minimal pollution and is sustainable over the long term, when we align our purpose with our values, we create this clean environment and we tap into a sustainable source of joy, passion, energy in our lives. And that has a positive impact on the climate, on our marriage, on our family, on our community. This has a positive effect. And just as clean energy is more efficient and sustainable, when our values are aligned with our purpose, we are more efficient, we're more effective, we're living according to deeper eternal values, we're tapping into a renewable source of strength and resilience that isn't ours, and we are able to navigate the challenges of life more gracefully, more groundedly, and more centered in God. In our gospel reading, Jesus offers us these two metaphors, and I love them. Each of them are about not standing out or standing apart from others, but being connected and being part of something bigger than ourselves. Salt. Have you ever tried to just eat salt? I don't think you'll last very long. Salt isn't a meal. But add a little salt to a meal, comes alive. Salt preserves, it enhances the meal. Same thing with light. Have you ever tried to stare at light for five minutes, ten minutes, an hour? Have you ever tried to stare at the sun for a while? Don't do it. I promise you it's not going to go well. Because light is not about itself. It's about shining on others. We see things because of light, but we don't look at light. So both of these metaphors or about connecting with something bigger, being part of something bigger. Jesus is saying, be the kind of people who keep things from spoiling and enhance the flavors all around you and shine light on others and on God. And that's what a meaningful, purposeful life is about. It's about doing our small part for the big picture of God's kingdom. It's about investing wholeheartedly into our work, into our lives. It's about dissolving into the meal and shining a light on what God's doing in the world. In other words, things don't work when we focus on ourselves, but they start to work when we focus on transcending ourselves. And that's the irony, that if we find work, where we can invest ourselves in, work that's bigger than us, whatever it is, even if it's laying bricks, we find more joy and we discover that we're happier. We're more effective, we're more efficient. To be salt, to be light, to be partners with God, there's an energy and a beauty to that that we can tap into. I'll never forget where I was when I read this, heard this poem read to me the first time. I was in my early 20s. I was burning dirty energy. My life was not aligned, and I knew it. And I heard these words, and they got my attention. They stopped me, and they woke me up. When you get what you want in your struggle for self, and the world makes you king for a day, just go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what that man has to say. For it isn't your father or mother or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. The fellow whose verdict counts most in your life is the man staring back from the glass. He's the fellow to please. Never mind all the rest, for he's with you clear to the end, and you've passed your most difficult, most dangerous test if the man in the glass is your friend. You may fool the whole world down the pathway of years and get pats on the back as you pass. But your final reward will be heartache and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. It was a gut blow. A gut blow when I heard that. And I decided because of that poem, I was going to try to look myself in the eye, in the mirror. And here's what I noticed. I noticed two things. First, I realized I couldn't do it. I couldn't. 
could not get myself to look myself in the eye because I knew I was cheating the man in the glass. It was clear to me there was a gap between purpose and values. It was clear at some deep level that I was not living the life that God wanted me to live. I was burning dirty energy and my life lacked meaning and purpose and it wasn't sustainable and I knew it and I wasn't ready yet to confront that truth. But then something else happened. Something bigger than me steered me to that mirror and led me to look into my own eyes. And what I expected to see looking back at me was judgment and condemnation. That's what I expected. But what I received was love. The deepest, most genuine, most merciful love that I've ever experienced. And as scary as it was and as it is to make life changes, to better align our lives with our purpose, I realized something really important in that moment. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. You see, when life is about me, myself, and I, and we're living out of our small self, that is as lonely as it can be. But when we realize that we're not the center, and we realize that God is the center, we can never be lonely because we're doing it together. We're in partnership with one who knows us better than we know ourselves, who knit us together in our mother's womb, who loves us completely and perfectly. And this one is with you always. There's an ancient Hasidic tale that I love about Rabbi Zusia. And he says, when I'm an old man and I come into the kingdom of heaven, God will not ask me, Zusia, why were you not Moses? I'm not going to ask that question. Zusia, why were you not Zusia? I hope you'll look yourself in the eye today or later this week. And I hope you'll ask, who am I? I hope you won't ask yourself that question. I hope you'll ask God that question. And I hope you'll find the courage to ask the next question. Whose am I? And I hope that you will not tell yourself what you intend to do with your life. But you will ask God, what do you intend to do with me? Amen.